As John Glancy mentioned a moment ago, we're in the middle of our stewardship campaign, and for these next three weeks, we're going to be talking a little bit about money. So this is not the Sermon on the Mount, this is the Sermon on the Amount. <laughs> Old pastor joke there, that one's been around a long time. The Sermon on the Amount, yeah, it is. Now last week, we talked about how treasure matters, and the treasure we were holding last week were these rites of passage, these moments in our lives where we turn a page from one chapter to the other. We need to hold those well. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to be talking specifically about money. So I want you all to just squirm for a minute, get it out of your system now, because sometimes when we listen to these words of Jesus, they can cause us to squirm. I'll call it a little bit of holy discomfort as we all move through this work of listening to what Jesus has to say about our treasure. This entire series is a series on generosity, stewardship, and caring about what matters. It would be wrong for any of us to think that this is a sermon series about money. It's not. It's about our discipleship and how our discipleship is expressed and how we hold one another and how we hold our resources that God has given us. This morning, I wanted to share with you simple, four simple keys about how we can make the most of money. Not make the most money, but make the most of money. Four simple keys. And the first one is simple enough. It is watch for the little habits. I'm going to say it again. Watch for the little habits. Jesus said in Luke 16, verses 10 to 11, the one who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful in much. And the one who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust true wealth to you? You know, sometimes we're tricked into thinking that the small decisions or the small choices in life, even the small things we do with money, don't matter as much as the big things we do. Now, you might remember that when pandemic started, back in 2020, I know a lot of us have tried to dismiss that from our minds, there were little habits that people had that during the pandemic, when most of us were at home, became amplified. The Australian government was so worried about the amplification of small choices turning into big problems, they produced this commercial. Our lives will head back that to I normal, hope you can hear. but there's something we don't want tagging along with us. It only takes around 66 days for a new routine to become a little habit. Like having a few drinks every night. That's about the time many of us spent in lockdown. Go to littlehabit.com.au for tips on how to break it. Don't let a little habit turn into a big problem. That's what my habits look like. I don't know about yours. <laughs> Little kind of purple gremlins around my house. Well, so you can understand that for many people in the pandemic, they began consuming more alcohol. The al consumption of alcohol skyrocketed in the pandemic because maybe people had little habits, but now that they're around the house by themselves doing their own things or not really seeing people, little habits turned big. You'll be happy to know that the consumption of alcohol in the United States has dropped by 20% in 18 months, 20%. The most popular beverages to order in a restaurant that serves cocktails are not cocktails, but mocktails now. These are cocktails that contain no alcohol in them. They look like a cocktail, but there's no booze in it whatsoever. And so there's been some sense of trying to correct what was little thing turning into a big habit, trying to get back into some sense of alignment. Now, I don't get to talk about my wife's work very often, and she's up in kids' camp working with children right now, so this is a perfect opportunity to do so, because she's not here. But I did ask her if I could tell this story. My wife has been a bank auditor and does bank taxation for 30 years. She has a CPA license from the state of California, and so she has been working as a CPA all that time in public accounting. And one of the things that she finds from time to time is when there's an individual who's working at a bank who begins to embezzle money. It does happen. 
And typically how this happens, it usually follows the same beginning. There's an individual who works at a bank. They have some kind of financial need, medical bills, some debt, something happening in their life that has really kind of caused them to experience a moment of desperation. And so they embezzle $500. And then the next month, it's $1,000. And then a few months later, it's 5,000 and then 10,000. And what happens is a very, very small little choice at the beginning turns into a significant amount of fraud just by somebody making a small choice in a small setting for a relatively small amount. Most of the banks Bettina works on today uh, have anywhere from about 500 million to about four or five billion dollars in assets and do business across many states. So you can see how easy it is to hide a small amount. Small habits, small choices can become big ones. And Jesus warns us about this very thing. The one who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful in much. The one who is unrighteous in a very little thing is also unrighteous in much. Wealth has a power to amplify any weak point in our life. So mitigating the power of money and wealth on the front end with integrity is incredibly important for all of us. So there's a question here that's raised. Jesus says that we're to be faithful in a little and we'll be entrusted with much. Well, what does being faithful mean? How do we do this act of faithfulness? I want you to take the idea of faithfulness with money and I want you to park it in your parking lot for about 10 minutes. I'm going to come back to it in a moment. What does it mean to be faithful? So key number one, watch for the little habits, the little choices we make. The second key, we hold wealth more than we have it. We hold wealth more than we have it. Luke 16, 12 says this, and if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is in others, who will give you which is your own. You know, this verse is speaking about how we hold wealth that's not our own, and so you would have to go back and read the parable Jesus tells before this passage of Scripture to understand what unrighteous wealth is. Um, there's a parable of the unfaithful steward. It's one of the most puzzling parables that Jesus tells. He basically says to take other people's money and give it away to people who are indebted to the person you took the money from. That gets a big thumbs up from Jesus. The parable after this passage of scripture is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You remember the rich man who saw Lazarus every day, poor, begging for food, begging for something in order to have some sustenance, and the rich man denied him. They both die. They go to their respective places in the afterlife. Lazarus, the poor man, goes to heaven. The rich man goes to hell. And there's an exchange that happens between them. Jesus is making it clear about how we're to be faithful with money. Remember that's parked in the parking lot? Leave it there for just a few more minutes. We have, hold wealth more than we have it. If you read this passage of scripture in Luke chapter 16, that's sandwiched between these two parables, Jesus uses the phrase, give you and trust to you and offer to you several times. In every one of those statements, Jesus is implying and even explicitly helping us understand that that which we have does not belong to us. It's entrusted to us. Somebody gave it to us. So the sense of entitlement sometimes we have about what we have in terms of money is a deception. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 paints a, uh, well, vivid picture of this problem. Are you all sitting down? Ecclesiastes 5, 13 to 15. There is a sickening evil which I have seen under the sun, Wealth being hoarded by its owner to his detriment. When that wealth was lost through bad business and he had fathered a son, there was nothing to support him. As he came naked from his mother's womb, so he will return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. That's painful. Ecclesiastes is a sobering 
book, reminding us of realities. To be honest, we already knew, but sometimes we just kind of care to put aside. To be honest, wealth and money can be a deceiver and that they trick us into believing that what we have belongs to us. And we read the teaching of Jesus many times in many gospels. He makes it clear that the money and the wealth we possess does not belong to us. We are stewards of it. We hold it more than we have it. Let's go to the third key. Money is a quick master. Money is a quick master. Luke 16, 13 says this, No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now, in the ancient world, in the time of Jesus, there were some occasions in which a slave was owned by two different masters. And it happened in a case when a person wanted to have a slave but could not afford a full share So they would typically buy half of a slave and someone else would buy the other half. Now, I just need you to set aside the complete human evil of slavery. And I want you to follow what Jesus is trying to say with slavery being a reality of his world. He's saying that when a slave is in this predicament of being owned by two different people, there's no way the slave will ever be able to satisfy both masters. Because every master, even though they own a half share, they're going to act like what? They own a whole share. And so the slave is going to be constantly in competition with which master they're going to please today. And over time, one master is going to prove to be more benevolent than the other. Thus, the slave will hate one master and love the other. Jesus is saying this is our relationship with money and with wealth. If we love it... Jesus is saying in not so many words, we'll grow to hate everything else. This is how money and wealth work. We cannot underestimate that this is one of the chief sins of our time, friends. We live in an era when the wealthy become wealthier and the poor becoming poorer. And to turn a blind eye from that is in many ways to tell Jesus to turn the blind eye to it. The early Methodists were very keen to this problem about wealth and money. Not too long after John Wesley's death, the founder of Methodism, the Book of Discipline in the Methodist Episcopal Church, which is our predecessor denomination, before the Methodist Episcopals threw us out in 1859, 1860, we were part of the Methodist Episcopal Church. And in 1808, they had a section of their book of discipline that was ours at that point in time as well that talked about church buildings. Do you want to hear it? I'm going to put it up on the screen. The question is, is anything advisable in regard to the building? The answer, let all our churches be built plain and decent, but not more expensively than is absolutely unavoidable. Otherwise, the necessity of raising money will make rich men necessary to us. But if so, we must be dependent on them, yea, and governed by them. And then farewell to the Methodist discipline, if not doctrine too. Ouch. So much for the building campaign, hmm? Money and wealth are dangerous, and this is what we need to hear from Jesus. They're dangerous, but the danger can be mitigated. I'll get to that in just a second. I shared with you before that when I finished seminary at the ripe age of 26 years old, and I knew all knowledge in the universe, (laughs) I was appointed to my very first church in Capistrano Beach, California. I dutifully showed up every week having my first full-time job in my life after working as a part-time staff person in a church, and I worked part-time as a collector for a Christian credit union. (laughs) (laughs) My first full-time job, I dutifully showed up at church every week and made sure I gave $20 every week. 
even though I was making magnitudes more money than I had ever made in my life, even in my first year as an appointed Methodist pastor, and my wife had just started her career as a CPA 30 years ago, we were tippers. I had a wonderful rationale in my head. Remember when I knew all knowledge in the universe? I had it all worked out in my head. One of my very best friends, um, after about a year of that behavior, confronted me and said, Craig, how in good conscience can you ever talk to your congregation about money if you're not giving any of it? That's all he had to say. Just cut to the heart. So the next week, we went from giving less than 1% to 10%. I wasn't sure how we were going to do it because when I took the ledger out and tried to figure out the money, because believe it or not, even though my wife is a CPA, I do the finances. It may have something to do with my controlling personality. I don't know. (laughs) On paper, it didn't work. On paper, we were never going to be able to pay our bills. We were renting a little duplex in Capistrano Beach, California. We just had no idea how that was going to happen, but we simply said, well... This is God's call, so we're going to do it. It's been 30 years, friends. There's not been one day of want in my house ever since. Not one day. Now, I won't say that God has made me a wealthy man, but by comparison to most of the global population, I'm extraordinarily wealthy. God has always provided. And there's a reason God always provides, and it's the fourth key. Are you ready for it? Make money and wealth your servant. Make money and wealth your servant. Remember a few moments ago I told you to park that question in the parking lot? What does it mean to be faithful to God with your money and your wealth? Well, take it out of the parking lot. We're going to drive that car right now. Make money and wealth your servant. Jesus outlines two relationships for us. We either serve money or serve God, not both. It is impossible. Remember when Jesus talked in verse 10 about being faithful with what we have. If you're faithful in a little thing, you'll be faithful in much. If you're unfaithful in a little thing, you'll be unfaithful in much. Here's where faithfulness comes to bear. Our founder of our movement, John Wesley, is well known for an adage that's kind of cobbled together from some of his writings that basically boils down to earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. So today we just want to focus on the earn all you can. Now, after a sermon like today, why in the world would I tell everybody to go earn all you can? Because earning all you can is one of the only ways you can actually be faithful with your money. Money is dangerous. Money is dangerous. Wealth is dangerous to our discipleship. Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. You remember hearing that? And then what's the very next thing he says? But with God, all things are possible. So apparently there's hope for we wealthy people, at least by global standards. We should earn all we can. Why? In the Luke 16 context of the parable that comes before and the parable that comes after, if money is our master, see the imagery of slavery working again? If I'm the slave to the money, what happens? Oh boy, I have a problem. That is what it means to accumulate money to one's own ends. But if money is our servant, then we practice generosity for the sake of others. Money, my friends, is not the problem. What we do with it is. If your money and wealth are working for you, in other words, you're working for it, you might want to pay attention. But if you only have one master and his name is Jesus Christ, then your money now works for him. The reason money makes us uncomfortable when we talk about it in terms of giving is because it is so quickly quantifiable. 
I remember almost 30 years ago going to hear Rick Warren speak at a conference at Saddleback Church when they were meeting in a tent in Lake Forest, California. And Rick said, the number one way you can measure a person's discipleship is to look at their checkbook. You can see what a person's priorities are, what they care about, what percentage of their income they're giving to other people. That's what makes us uncomfortable because it's a quick look at where we are at in terms of generosity and faithfulness. And so what happens for many of us is simply we choose not to look. Ignorance is, after all, bliss, is it not? But when we look, we begin to realize what our priorities are, what we care about, what's important to us, what's significant in our lives. And by looking at that, we can begin to get a grasp of where we need to go in our life. If God is our master, then we are his servants. And as servants, everything we have is to be used by him. So you should go all earn all you can. Why? So you can give all you can. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about examples from the Bible like Paul and others who were bankrolled by wealthy people. Wealth is important when it's used faithfully. When it's not used faithfully, it is the most dangerous encumbrance to our spiritual life, and it will drag our soul to hell. Yes, I said it. It's like an anvil tied around your neck. And we need to take it that seriously. Jesus makes it clear. You cannot serve wealth and God. I didn't say it. He did. The reality is, is that for many of us, we... We sometimes struggle with finances. We struggle with how to hold it, struggle with how to use it. We struggle to apply these four keys. I struggle with it constantly. I'm very materialistic. So God has to snap me out of that from time to time and slap me silly. So I can remember the purpose of having wealth is to give it away. I'm aware there's probably people here in the sanctuary this morning that you're just carrying a massive amount of debt. I used to be a collector. I know what it's like to talk to people who are under the weight of debt and how hard that is. What a challenging moment in life that is. So we're going to do something a little different today as we get ready to have communion. I'd like you, if you would please, because we've already taken the offering so there's no threat, take out your purse or wallet and just put it in your lap. Just put it in your purse or lap. Put your purse or wallet in your lap. And I just want you to hold it like this. And we're going to pray over our money right now. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for this incredible gift you've given us. That, Lord, the, the wealth that we have, the money we have, whether it's a very, very, very little bit or a lot, all of it belongs to you. And so, God, with our hands placed on our money right now, I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you would, in this room, break every bondage around finances today. For those who are in debt, God, we pray that you would lead them toward freedom for those, God, addicted to possessions and the having and getting, I pray that you would liberate them. For all of us, God, who struggle to be good stewards, we pray that you would release us for generosity, for giving. For this, God, is how we imitate you. So we commit our money, whether we're holding in our hands 50 cents $500 or $50,000 of credit limit. We place it in your hands. And together, God, I pray for all of us that we will say this day that money is not our master, but you are. And that when we give, we are more like you than ever. 
as we gather around this table, we remember your giving act, how Jesus took bread, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And after the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and returned thanks to you and gave it to the disciples, saying, take drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So Lord, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. May they be a reminder to us of what you have given out of generosity so that we might give generously. Lord, we thank you for these gifts and pray that you would empower us to be set free, to be set free from the power of money and wealth through the mighty name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.